safety, of prosperity, and equality. It just doesn't make any sense. So naturally, homeless people are often policed and they're criminalized for basic kinds of activities, including many of the things that are happening in Occupy camps. You know, the sharing of food in public space is a criminal act. Seriously? Have we gotten that far away from any kind of decent culture that the sharing of food in public is a crime? What other kinds of things are criminalized in public that maybe you've all Sleeping. come around to? Yeah. Sleeping, right? What's the rule here in Phoenix? You can't close your eyes for more than three seconds? I don't even think they have a rule. It changes every day. It changes every day. It's not the fuck who you protest driving right. is the rule. Right. And not what you're wearing. Well, how do they define someone sleeping, though? Like, who has anybody no. been approached under this, guys? What's the way it's Okay, presented? so I got arrested for camping a little over two weeks ago, and this, according to the Phoenix PD, this is camping. Having a backpack. He was not sleeping. I yeah. was standing up, right. had my backpack on my shoulder. I had my dog's leash in my hand, and I was walking. I was actually in movement. When the officer grabbed me by the shoulder and said, you're under arrest for camping. So it's urban camping because you have a backpack that looks like it could contain sleeping gear. It's urban camping if the police don't walk you. They'll make something up. Right, right. And I've noticed this all over the country. And they change the rules of the state. Right. Yeah. According to who they're arresting them. Right. So that's not well, a very even-handed application of rules. If they're going to be rules, which maybe we shouldn't even have them at all, but if there were any, you think they have to apply evenly and equally. But they can change and they're at the discretion. You can be profiled. I mean, I drove, you know, up Central before, and there were a lot of people sitting on the sidewalk, but they were shoppers. Nobody was going to hassle them. Even in one moment, there was a police officer on one corner and a, a, a woman, middle-aged woman and her daughter, both white, sitting on the corner right across, and they weren't going to get hassled. But depending on the way you manifest your identity, you might actually get contacted for something like that. So we have laws against sharing of food in public, laws against sleeping in public. What else? What other things are being used to criminalize both vulnerable communities like the homeless and Occupy camps as well? Uh, anybody in a group of four or more is now considered a gang. Right? So the gang and junction. Especially if, if, if we wear bandanas right. or matching beanies or anything, we're now a gang. Last time I checked, it was called peacefully assembly. Right. I mean, there's nothing in the Constitution that says people shall have the right to peace, you know, peaceably assemble. But not less than four. Three. Yeah. Unless yeah. well, three or you know, only three maximum. I mean, that doesn't sound like a, a particularly effective way to get social change going. The only so way to get around that is to have a badge. They didn't, they didn't give us any uh, any problems today. There were five of us with with backpacks. You're throwing your colors? You look pretty dangerous, too, I have to say. Oh, you got to watch out for that health game, man. That's right. Those medics, they might actually help you They're or something. They're running around giving people free health care. That's probably illegal in public spaces. It's social. If it's not, somebody's writing a law about it right now. Although we have had our medics arrested. Yeah. With yeah. their face crosses showing and everything else, arrested because they're also... So what other kinds of things have been used to chip away at our rights to be gathered together and explore community in public places? Ouch. Anybody? <laughs> Illegal to sit on the sidewalk. Yeah. Like what you're doing right That's now. That's before 9 p.m. though. <laughs> the law tells you to sleep on the sidewalks after 9 p.m. Yeah. I lived in Seattle for a number of years. Well, that if law, lived, sitting squatting. on the sidewalk, is, is, a, is a crime almost everywhere, actually. It's not just Seattle. That was one of the places where it started. But that law has been copied and applied all over the place, including here in Phoenix. So you can't sit down. That's pretty basic, right? Yeah, well, you have to keep walking.
<laughs> they call it the officer's discretion. The rest of us call it selective enforcement. That's right. There's actually a name for it in the law. The laws are enforced selectively. I'm fighting a jaywalking ticket right now. Mm -hmm. So you add all this up, right? This is all really low-level stuff. And in fact, not only is it low level, they're just like kind of basic, you know, things that if you did them in another context, they'd be completely innocuous. Sitting down and sharing food sounds like an ordinary, you know, time in somebody's living room or dining room. It's like not a controversial thing. It's when you do it in public, and it's when you also have kind of a political context wrapped around it that it becomes fair game for being cracked down. They also, in Florida, non occupy related at all, arrested a that are involved in a non-profit organization to feed the homeless. That's right. But, and they actually put on the headline, like, feeding the homeless was illegal. That's and I was right. like, what are they, bears? Yeah, yeah. These are human beings. Yeah. Do not so feed the homeless. Yeah. It's dangerous and it only encourages them. Yeah. yeah. Totally. totally. So it's not just yeah. occupied. This is widespread. That's right. and, and that's wrong. That's why we're here. Totally. And that's exactly what I'm trying to bring in is, like, the connectivity. I think you all get it, and I'm glad that you all get it. Not every audience that you talk to, every group you're with gets it completely, but you see that like these patterns are the same everywhere you look. We can take the word immigrant and homeless and occupy, and there's a lot of, you know, and keep going with extra, with more categories. The themes are very similar across a lot of these things. We're talking about a larger, fundamental issue in society, but sometimes the concrete examples are helpful to get our minds around how it actually plays out. You can be a refugee in your own country. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Stranger in a strange land. Yeah. You know, you, you talk about memory, uh, peeing in public. Uh, when, when I was uh, uh, getting aware of homelessness in New York, there were no public restrooms. And uh, now, like on 42nd Street, they built, 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 <laughs> and it's about basically the plight of a, kind of does like an ethnographic look at the, the day in the life of a homeless person yeah. looking for a bathroom. Yeah. And it's not <laughs> that easy to find. Amen you know? to that. It's Amen a, to that. So, I mean, you know, if you want to make it a crime for people to sleep, for people to share food, for people to use the bathroom, for people to gather together, you know, in groups more than four, it's like <clears throat> you're not just taking away the, the cornerstones of democracy, you're taking away the cornerstones of existence itself. You're telling people they can't exist unless they're shopping, unless they're buying something. Yeah. Move along unless you're here to per make a purchase, you know? And this isn't a mall, this is our world, you know? This isn't a, a situation where we voluntarily went into a space of consumption. We're existing in our society, and we're being told that we can't be here unless we're, you know, doing something consumptive in the process. Sorry, I just have to take a look and see where my little... They leave little bags so going? you can pick up your doggy goo. But they don't leave no toilet paper. <laughs> Sorry, my parent radar is strong. They have little batteries. <laughs> That's my main activism right there, actually. Yeah. Georgia North of the Future. That's right. That's right. Though I wouldn't go to the second in the UK, so I fully agree with you. Daddy! I just think I'd go over there. It's not an easy thing to do, I'll tell you. No, it is. Yeah. I wouldn't listen to our, our, our new sure. governor stay in the state of the I wouldn't listen to our new governor's state of the state address, and she mentioned community. Hey, what the big And the thing is, like, when I hear people here talk about community, I hear inclusiveness. I hear the want to include everybody. But when I hear people like Jan Brewer say the word community, I distinctly feel that her community doesn't involve anybody but people like her. You know, and it's sad that we live in a society where, oh, if you don't make six figures a year, you're a nobody. You know what I mean? We, 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 we live in a society where you work 60, 70 hours a week just so you can pay to work 60 or 70 hours a week. And these are the people just barely making it. You know? I mean, I personally took a vow of poverty. I'm not, I, I don't even, I don't consider myself homeless. I consider myself residentially impaired. You know? <laughs> I chose not to live inside. And I thought when I was younger that I lived in a country where I was free to express myself in any way I saw fit as long as I wasn't hurting people. But God forbid you 
do anything in this country to express yourself, say, give away all your property and tattoo your face. Because then automatically you're a terrorist or you've been to prison. Cops look at you like you're, you're another number. You know what I mean? And it's one of those things like, even right now, if this group were sitting here and a group of people like you were sitting 30 feet away, I bet you the cops would come roust us because they thought we were moving to be harassing. Things that, that can't be co-opted are commodified. The things that can't be commodified are criminalized, right? That's the progression. And when you mark yourself as non-commodifiable, criminalization is the next step because there's no use for you anymore. Maybe to fill a prison bed or something, you know? That's what it comes down to. <clears throat> We're turning the world into a place where everything has a resource value or it's by definition just not even part of the community. And so that's exactly right. Words like community can be easily co-opted and turned into just another form of exclusionary politics. But when we say, you know, citizen, we're excluding people. When we say community, we're excluding people. When we say public, we're excluding people. I mean, how come when homeless people are in public spaces, the police aren't protecting those homeless people? Are they suddenly not members of the public? I, I, there's no legal definition I've ever seen that would exclude a human being from being part of the public that the police were sworn to protect and serve. It's not even controversial, really. It's, they're members of the public. It's a public space. Why are you shooing them along to have other people use that space? There's not supposed to be that kind of competition. So these are very real questions. You know, They cut to the core of many ways about what it means to be fully human in a world that's rapidly Some of the 
the Occupy camps were struggling with this issue. How do you have an open space that's welcoming to all, and suddenly you get flooded with these homeless people who have high needs and great demands, and they're not really there for the politics of it, and it's all, you know, and some camps broke up over things like this. Some of it was the, fa the, uh, the, the flames were fanned by authorities, actually opening homeless shelters and pointing people toward Occupy. Go down there, they'll give you a free meal, knowing full well that it could create conflicts. The camps weren't able to absorb that many people, but it was an issue, and it still kind of is. But for a while there, it was definitely like at the front of the dialogue about can camps, can these Occupy camps actually walk their talk and, and absorb all these homeless folks? I actually wrote a piece in response to that. I called it Welcome Home. And the idea was that the Occupy camp should embrace homeless people because there's a lot to learn right there. If you want to know how to survive in public, how to get by on, on with resiliency and knowing your legal rights and what constitutes a crime and how to push back and you really had to hold tight, you know, in, in the face of overt oppression, homeless people can share a lot of stories to help with that narrative right there. Uh, I just wanted to say that, like, often the police would come up and talk to me when I was sitting here, uh, trying to talk us out of, of staying here in the encampment or in the plaza, saying that, like, during the day there were only four or five, there were a few people and they were usually homeless, <coughs> giving the impression that occupiers <coughs> and homeless had to be different and that homeless people weren't legitimate protesters. Right, so right. you saw that mirrored through the authorities, too. Totally. Like in LA, they sort of divided Occupy into uptown Occupy and downtown Occupy oh, nice. to try to make that clear that certain kinds of people were the downtown and certain were the uptown. <laughs> you know? Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead, man. I've been here since the ridiculous. I've been here since. I've been here since November 6th. And uh, same I knew Wells Fargo is sneaking up on us. <laughs> hey, uh, but uh, I've overheard like three conversations with homeless versus not homeless. And anymore, when you say night shift, I eat homeless. Uh, they have a house, they, meaning a certain woman, rented a house outside of GA. But everybody wants to want to call a the house, but it's not. But uh, who's the f first people that get boarded out? Well, I, I was the first person. That's because I clowned her about, uh, uh, can I illegally camp in your living room? Because you can't have pills. But it's all about homeless. And it still is. It still fucking is. And you know what? I, I've learned so much since I've been homeless. I, I, I've been treated better. And I've treated, been treated worse than when I had a job. I've, had, I, I've got both sides of the spectrum. But you know what? It's still a fucking issue. Excuse me. Sorry. I apologize. It's still an issue. Totally. I haven't had my kids in two years. They live in Milwaukee myself. <laughs> I have to reacclimate myself. Right. But it's still an issue here. I apparently it's an issue everywhere. And, um, and, you know, I, this, this stuff makes me cry. Whether or not they would have to go pick up trash or hold signs before they would be allowed to get a plane. Yeah. I can walk yeah, up. I haven't I been here all day. That. I just got off work, but I can waltz up and grab anything I want. I Everybody's happy to I see me. That. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. It's still well, but, actually, actually anymore. That's not so good. I remember. These are really hard questions. I mean, let's face it. It's not like we're in a, some you know beautiful, abundant natural space where we can invent the world anew. We're in the midst of all this. So we're making the best with the tools at our disposal. I understand you that, know? brother. But a lot of people are talking a good game. But when it comes to walking the walk, well, uh, who are we going to keep going? Right. Who are we going to give food to? So and, and that makes me cry. Other than the fact that I miss my kids. Yeah, yeah. Shit like that makes me cry. Like I said, I've, been, I, I've, been, I've had some of the best treatment, and I've had some of the worst treatment. I've been homeless for like two years. And yeah, you know what? People want like, like black and white this issue. Yeah, I, I can apply myself maybe a little more, but it ain't out there. And it was and like Officer Tucker's and his partner were the ones that like I tried I stumbled into a conversation and I had to explain myself. I'm like, look, it's not black and white. Who giggled? They ain't fuck. Police officers giggled like school children. And I fucking walked away. I said, F you. And I stopped, I said, F you. Because they giggled at me because I was trying to explain something they asked me and they're like, oh, you choose to be homeless. Well, I guess technically, like, because I don't apply myself like I should, like, like, it 
Anyways, I, 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 I'm, so I'm sorry, man. Let's go. Cool. Thanks, thanks for sharing. There's some other folks that want to get. You've had your hand up for a while. Hi, I'm Mel. I'm Mel with the Unity Block, and uh, I I visited close to about 18 different occupies now on my walk from Tacoma, Washington, down here. And uh, one of the most impressive uh, occupy camps that I one of the most impressive occupy camps that I've been to was the Occupy Eugene camp, where they literally had a geodesic dome in the middle, teepees and other tents and whatnot. They had a kitchen. They had medical tents, they had a library, a, a place for, uh, for extra clothing, blankets, and other booths that uh, were designed to give information to anybody who was willing to, to come in. And I stayed there about four days. The first day I got there, I had noticed quite a bit of um, uh, argumentative behavior between many of the campers. And the story basically was that all the homeless started gathering in that area and there was talk about how that might negatively affect the, the encampment and the Occupy movement in itself. But after a couple days what happened was I discovered that the police were actually glad that the encampment was there. Why? Because the homeless gathered in that area. The indigents, the troublemakers, the so-called people that caused all the problems in the town of Eugene were all of a sudden concentrated in an area where the police were actually able to keep an eye on them. Now, that mentality, because Eugene, of course, is kind of one of those hippie towns, was readily accepted. And what I noticed happening were the people, when they were in the beginning, and this is a four-day span, were more or less just roaming around trying to figure out what this this utopian tent city was all about because to them this was an oasis in the desert now the kitchens were so well stocked and that the people were so well and so much involved in making things happen the citizens actually stayed in the encampments on a regular basis and the homeless were being fed food that was good for them as opposed to the shelters who feed them sugar and put them on, on uh, prison mats in, in bays and, and indoctrinate them or try to indoctrinate them back into this, this particular system that they, they really don't want anything about. But what happened was after my fourth day, I could see the cognizance returning to a lot of these homeless people and the police were grateful. The people were becoming more helpful and even the homeless began shaping the cityscape of that little encampment. The last day I was there, I was treated and the whole encampment was treated to a 20 course meal, which was, became a regular occurrence. So people had choices of uh, good food, home cooked food every day, three meals a day and vegetarian meals if they didn't like meat so on and so forth. And it was wonderful because I talked to these homeless people who were actually coming out of these days of, of the, the, the poisons they've been fed by these shelters and whatnot with this intellectual conversation that astounded me. I was to the point where, wait a minute, if we consider these people indigents and, and lacking in mental capacity when they are far more intellectual than we give them credit to be. So what, what I've noticed is that if we can gather the civilian community together, which is happening here, and I, and I see that, and actually approach the council members, which I saw happen as, as well, because the police are, are more or less a lot more calm how they deal with, with the people here, the, the community in and of itself will begin to grow within these encampments. And it, it was amazing. The, 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 the encampment was cleaner than most of the other parks. And people were gathering together and having these classes like this regularly. And for me, I saw a great deal of hope. And one of the reasons why I continue walking right now is because I want to share this with those people who haven't had a chance to actually experience other occupies and the different dynamics that occur. The same thing started happening in Las Vegas where they actually leased property. So one of the considerations, I might want to throw it out there as a solution or possible, you know, modality to
accommodate the occupants and those who wish to actually stay there and, and show this entire city that it can be done is to approach these city councilmen or whoever is in charge or, or maybe even find a private person who can offer up a space where we can lease it at a reasonable amount and people donate a buck a piece, you know, whatever it takes to go ahead and, and begin this community to show the world that if we work together and use our love and our kindness and our sharing which is happening right here, right now, things can begin changing. The homeless can become healthy again. They can begin to think. They can begin to serve in the, that little microcosm and then practice these communication skills, these, these, abilities, these consensus type democracy rather than this majority rule and minority suffer behavior that we've been so entrenched in and indoctrinated in all our lives. And I think that you guys are doing a wonderful job. I've got so much good stuff to share with all my friends and, and the people that are following my walk around this world right now. So I, I just want to you know, say thank you for your hospitality and you guys are doing a wonderful job. Thank you. So solution oriented, right? Every crisis is kind of an opportunity in disguise. There's always that potential to take these challenges and turn them into viable outcomes, you know? And in fact, in some ways, we should be thankful for the challenge because it keeps us on our toes. It keeps stimulating us to evolve what we're doing and not just fall into some kind of a comfort zone or pat ourselves on the back for a small act when we've got a lot more work to be done. And there are counter narratives. There definitely are communities that have embraced the Occupy homeless, you know, community member nexus that has developed. One example is Occupy Memphis which is um, you know, a small Occupy camp, but it's in a very graphic spot, and it's largely populated by homeless people and community activists, and the police have been kind of supporting it because they see it as a viable, safer alternative to some of the places homeless people have been pushed out to in that community. It's almost like, it's not about containing it, it's about taking another element of danger to these people off the table, they get it. So that's one example. Another one that was interesting was in Atlanta after the Occupy camp got decimated. The activists and, and people in that camp didn't have a place to go. They wound up getting the, the third floor of a local homeless shelter temporarily to move Occupy into that space until it could figure out where else it might go in a public place. So the homeless shelter, actually the homeless community, took in Occupy, the, the inverse of what you've been seeing in other places around. So there's definitely counter narratives taking hold. That optimistic side has to be, we have to tell those stories. I like traveling around, collecting those stories, sharing them in other places. It's a very powerful thing, very powerful. Some other thoughts, yeah. yeah I want to maybe pick at like, what's behind this idea of uh, the conflict between um, like an occup Occupy and the people experiencing homelessness. I think like the 99% has been fed this like lie, this idea of false scarcity so that there's not enough for us to share. And so thus we must compete over those scarce yeah, resources. Yes, thus we must compete. And that's um, like there's not enough to fund the bus system. There's not enough to make budget meet. Like, this idea of false scarcity is, um, is really keeping a lot of citizens in fear and voting against things they wouldn't normally vote against. And as you say, it's false, right? As Gandhi said, there's enough for the needs of all, but not the greed of a few. And the problem isn't the, the amount of resources, it's the distribution of those resources. But go ahead and finish. I didn't mean to cut no, you off. Okay, well, I'm glad I stepped in when I did. Thanks. Other thoughts? This one simple thought. How many, how many people here rent? How many people are paying rent? So all it takes to be homeless, like for instance, if you're renting a car, you tell people it's not your car, you're renting your car. You know, if you're renting an apartment, a house, anything, you're renting. So all it takes to be void of that thing is to not pay the rent. So they act like it's something that we did or something that people did. I choose to pay rent when I can because well, you know, there's a reason why when you look back throughout history, many of the people that we identify as kind of like the great evolved figures, you know, who have brought us wise teachings, etc. Um, you know, I'm of the belief that we all have that capacity. 
were all wise elders, but there are some that we identify as kind of iconic, you know, the Gandhis and the Buddhas, Jesus. They've all had these moments of voluntary poverty, voluntary homelessness. There's a reason why that's been a common thread in a lot of the great figures who have promoted, you know, the move from knowledge to wisdom that we so desperately need in our society. Um, because in that moment, when you kind of abandon all the material possessions, you're casting your lot with faith in your fellow human. And that's a powerful leap of faith to take. It's one that comes out in practice. You suddenly become, by necessity, reliant on others around you. Your own wits, too, but still, you're now in a relationship with the things that sustain you, rather than just a one-way relationship. You have to cultivate back and forth and build bonds and ties and try to, you know, you're not going to overfish the pond. You want to, like, keep things intact so that you can go back the next day learn to be more sustainable both socially and ecologically when you've disavowed a lot of the trappings that keep us in place. I said this at the workshop earlier today, we come to discover that the things that we hold tend to hold us actually. And by shedding some of those layers off, it's not to say everybody has the capacity to make that leap and really get rid of it all and just be down to the nitty gritty, but moving in that direction is part of our mission. We all have to reestablish our, our lifestyle much closer to the level of need than to the level of desire and want. We've been manufactured to think we need all this stuff, but truly what it takes to survive <laughs> isn't that much. There's way more than enough of that to go around. It's just that we're all gonna have to maybe think about scaling ourselves back a little bit. Um, and homelessness, you know, and a lot of folks are voluntarily in that condition because they get this on some level. Or maybe they're just allergic to participating in nine to five capitalist consumer society. But for whatever reason, a lot of folks have gotten that message that I'd rather just be really vulnerable and be without than even, you know, walk a, walk a little bit into those waters. So it is a very powerful statement. I think it can become kind of an image for empowerment rather than vulnerability if we do it together. It's the isolation that works against us and makes people vulnerable. But if we hang together, then we don't hang alone. That's a pretty powerful thing. Yes? got to get back up to that six percent. So isn't this mania to have constant economic growth in order to keep from sliding into recession what's driving these economic our planet <laughs> to the point of disaster? Propulsion of bacteria yeah. or cancer. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, really, it's the logic of cancer, basically, is constant growth. As if to say that anything that is, is either sustainable or maybe even scaling back is somehow, you know, just it's, it's, it's evil, actually. Yeah, go ahead. All right, gentlemen, three people or four people before was talking about these communities with the medical, the classes, the food, the pretty much everything. He talked about we had. The cops slowly cleaned us out until we're down to nothing. Um, any of you guys ever seen that pamphlet, Know Your Rights? Ever read it? It's been passed around here several times. Um, basically, you know, you can have tables. They talk about booths, um, permits required for large groups. We're not really a large group, we're a small group as of right now. Um, we were a lot larger. It wasn't hard to get 100 people down here every day when we first started this. Um, but the cops have slowly came in, cleaned people out, taken them to jail, fined them, ticket them, tell them not to trespass, go away, don't come back, stuff like that, or leave for a day. We've had that environment that we talk about here, right here. And if they could close that street down for tamales and other events and have their booths and permits, and even if those only apply to large groups, which they were, we're not a large group. So why couldn't we have our little canopies here, not tents, just canopies, without um, violating any laws? Why, why does the, the powers that be, why do they crack down on even small displays of, you know, tent camps and people gathering in numbers that are relatively small compared to other events when they're perfectly willing to close down streets and give space? How come? What's behind this? Why is it even just like, why would they just be like, oh, it's just a small 
little gathering, a few people. Let's let them do their thing. Who really cares? Because there's other events between profits or businesses, whereas this type of event is more deemed as something that is abhorrent to them and might drive away businesses. So it's a different ideology. It's a free economy, non-profit in the best sense of that word, not the institutional sense. And it also is conveying a message of asking people to unplug from profits. So there's that, for sure. The political context matters. Why else is it is it you know incumbent upon the state to crack down on every display of people gathering by consensus in the commons? Could you allow that Right. That's right. So you can't even allow small outbreaks. People might get the idea that they can liberate space, and once that gets out, it's like, oh, wait a minute, that could actually be something here. Especially if those camps and those those outbreaks are linked together and are sharing a culture and a narrative and stories and support. You can see the formidable nature of that. In fact, that's the moment we're living in. I mean, Occupy in just a few short months, it didn't come out of nowhere. If you've been paying attention, there's been <laughs> antecedents and seeds planted, but really the way it burst on the scene and captivated the world's imagination in just a few short months is kind of unprecedented. And the reason is because people could sense the palpable nature of the threat. The idea that people could liberate space in the centers of power, if that becomes the new growth model, you could really see it, you know, changing the old, you know, from within, from within the shell right there. Money, control, the idea of staying ahead of the narrative, making sure people don't get the idea that freedom is actually something you can practice. It's something that can be marketed back to you. Your freedom can be attached to your new cell phone plan or some other new gadget, but you know, we don't want people actually stepping out of the boundaries and practicing freedom in a way that's not part of the commodity structure. That's a pretty, you know, sobering realization. We all kind of know it, but to see it play out this dramatically buy the money system and see how quickly it tries to flood its control back in. There's an old expression that, you know, the world is going to either be colonized by McDonnell Douglas or McDonald's. Pick, pick, pick your choice, right? You can pick one. We'll do it in a friendly way through corporate globalization or we'll come in through, you know, the military industrial complex. But actually the two are really never far apart. They're always connected. Control and, you know, capital are pretty much linked. Um, you know, wherever you look, and you know the way the Occupy camps have been treated, it, treated is a very you know, classic example of that. What I want to know is how do we get that back legally? Does anyone have any answers? So how do we? Here we are. We're at this moment, right? We've laid out the issues. We kind of know what they are. We talked a little bit about some solutions. Let's do that as our closure here. Like, what do we? Where do we go next? What's the the hidden opportunity? What's the way we can turn this crisis into some viable solution? If I may, um, you know. That is the reason why I'm on my walk, so I can share this very important message, and, I, and I'm, I'm very thankful to the universe for allowing me to give, be given this chance to actually state this. How do we do it? The way we do it is that we, we have to go ahead and vibrate the thought of unifying all of ourselves together, not through fear, not through uh, rhetoric, but through logic and through examples from other camps, uniting a, a community together and bringing this community onto the doorsteps of the very people that were so-called elected into the position they're in. And we have to discuss it not in a manner where we are antagonistic, but rather intellectual, logical, and pretty much uh, not being able to argue against it, this, as long as you can show them, this, what they're looking for basically are statistics. In fact, we might even utilize the system itself and say, look, this is how profitable this can be for you if you do it this way, by putting together a plan and showing how the numbers work. And we, we just can't just pop up a city somewhere and expect them to accept that because they're just not prepared for it. So we must unify, we must be in unity together with the entire community who's involved in this. How many people are subscribed to the Occupy Phoenix website or Facebook or whatever it is? These people must be vibrating towards this unifying factor so that we can all go in there together, not just with someone as a spokesperson, but an entire mass of people. 
that's how it's going to change. That's all I have. Um, Thanks. Other thoughts? Yeah. Well, come back to you in a second. I, uh, obviously, uh, people have used First Amendment um, terms in terms of freedom of speech, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could use freedom of assembly at all. Oh, there Rand Randall, Randall's going, get us, kid. Um, and, but there, I mean, in terms of the criminalization of homelessness, there, there's a couple of different answers if you want to do different arguments. Uh, the main one is the Eighth Amendment argument, which is that it is cruel and unusual punishment for, uh, to make it a crime to camp if not, uh, if there isn't enough shelter provided. But that's not really what we're about. This is really more about freedom of assembly. We don't have the right to assemble, you know, and they want to constrain our right to assemble. And I, I don't know if there's any hope in that. I mean, obviously, there, like I said, there's the 8th and the, and the 14th, you know, but I don't know if there's any, any argument, legal argument that could be made around that. That's just a question. We've talked about this a little bit. You know, uh, in California, um, some urban camping laws were struck down under the Eighth Amendment. When they did the math, there were more homeless people than there were shelter beds. And so by definition, you were creating a, a whole category of hundreds or even thousands of people who would just by definition be criminal just for existing. And the courts found that to be cruel and unusual punishment. There's definitely some play in these things. I wouldn't abandon that project altogether. I also wouldn't stake our whole claim on legal issues because, you know, that is a narrative that's very, you know, managed and has its own elite influence and top-down way of thinking. But I think it's important to go through those channels. You know, we need to use civil obedience sometimes. We need to use uncivil obedience. Then we use civil disobedience and maybe civil dis uncivil disobedience. You know, but you, like all of those things should be on the table. Um, but certainly, I, I think what this gentleman said in terms of trying to build bridges and speak a common language and model what we're talking about and not be confrontational in a negative way, be inviting rather than off-putting, those are always very sound strategies. And the legal avenue gives us a mechanism sometimes to be able to do that. I wouldn't put it all in that, but I do think it should be part of the struggle for sure. Yeah, yeah. I also think that we should look just on what you said, uh, I think that we should use, try to find universal messaging that um, can be taken in by the, uh, there is no average person, but by a random person on, on the street, you know, um, sometimes you need to be militant, as, but sometimes you want to explain things to people in, um, real common terms about how this could really affect their lives and, you know, maybe put that out more into re recruiting, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I think we could take the energy of, um, of Occupy and use it to reinvigorate a lot of the public sector things that, uh, that have been shut down, so like different services or libraries, schools. Uh, there are people who suggest uh, Assisting people into into homes that they've been foreclosed. Uh, they're also Which great. Which is going direct, on everywhere, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The idea of occupying homes uh, for families who need them, uh, or the idea of uh, just directly helping. I know, like you know, there are groups like Seeds of Peace and Food Not Bombs that just take food. You know, like uh, taking food that, that other organizations, grocery things, would have thrown out or couldn't sell, uh, cooking it and feeding it to indigent people or to people who, who can't get meals and giving them good food and not just cheap food. So, this so is service opportunities. So this is the model where, you know, the Occupy camps are these laboratories of liberation. They still should exist. They need to exist. Maybe they're not going to be as fully blown as we thought. Maybe the system pushes back. But they're still here. There's still lessons to be learned. But ultimately, we all begin to take those teachings, take that spark of inspiration, take that culture of consensus and all of the other lessons, and implement it wherever we go. You know, so you start seeing people doing it with food, not bombs. Occupy homes, occupy the workplace. The word, the word occupy has become like the adjective of choice for this moment in history. You know, I wound up writing a piece a few weeks ago. I called it Occupy Ourselves. Let's take it down into our personal lives and see if we can get clear on some of the issues we were just talking about, about shedding out some of those layers that do keep us in place because we're afraid to lose the things that we have. 
So the logic of Occupy is clearly a powerful tool that can be used in a wide range of decentralized things. With the caveat, though, that I think we need the moment to then come back together in central places, in the commons, compare notes, share best practices, support each other, mobilize around shared values, but then go back out and kind of do this accordion method. There's a lot of power in that. Um, it's been done in Spain, actually, that exact method. The decentralized come together, decentralized come together. And it's been done to great effect in Spain for even longer than Occupy's been. Other uh, thoughts, yeah. We still have to figure out how to, how to fix the, uh, the mess workers, how to, I mean, the, you know, 50% of America is now considered low income. Um, you know, most people are just trying to keep a roof over their head and, and, uh, and manage the cars when they're not way. down here tonight. But America is behind us. And um, I think the more the, the message can just be put out to, to the media in every way possible, documentary, film, articles, um, you know, it, it, and then the politicians will fall in line when they realize just how really powerful this thing is. People are really scared. Yeah, people get it too, right? They get it. I mean, it. that's the thing. People get it. When they, they did these polls... They just don't polls, know how to fix it. Yeah. As much as you can trust opinion polls, when they were polling in October, what's the public perception of Occupy? This is after a lot of bad press, a lot of negative, you know, trying to really make it out to be something it wasn't. It was still polling at 66% yeah. approval, right? People get it. They understand the vulnerable situation that we're all in collectively here. When the stuff hits the fan for real, it's not going to just be, you know, uh, one part of the population that feels it, we're all going to be impacted it's by it. Coming. It's coming. No, it's already it's here in some yeah. You know, it's yeah, not it's some, something delayed. It's but it is, and people get that, and they are scared. The issue is, you know, I think you're right, um, until there's a, a viable narrative, a viable alternative, a viable constructive program, as Gandhi called it, where people can begin to migrate, it's very hard to ask folks to leave the lives, even if they know those lives are illusions. They're still stable on some level. And it's hard for folks to take that next step. But the more you gain traction around a new set of values, a new way of being in the world, it is the case that people more often than not would be willing to take that kind of a chance. And you know, there's another piece of this that, that's just come out to pass, the notion of the tipping point. Have you heard about this? That, you know, it's kind of the critical mass idea, the hundredth monkey or something. It turns out that as they study this scientifically, what does it take to reach a critical mass? What percentage of a population would you think it takes to turn the whole Paradigm. Is just it like ten percent or something. What is it? Is it like one percent? No, it's, 10, it's higher than that. Ten. <laughs> it's ten percent. I mean, for a long time, you might think critical mass is what fifty-one percent, maybe thirty-three percent. It's actually something around ten percent. Well, that's a lot of people, but it's not a huge percentage. And I suspect that there are at least ten percent of the people in this population ready to make a change because they see oh, yeah. the poverty of their lives. They, <laughs> even in the midst of their material abundance, they see the impoverishment of their spirit in those lives. And a viable alternative, were it to take hold, would actually be the kind of thing that could attract people toward it that might tip the balance. Not towards something that, that you know necessarily makes the rest of what we were doing evil and it's like, let's just chuck it all away. No, some parts of it will pass through the filter. We'll keep some parts of it, but we need to make that decision collectively based on the conditions here, not just because somebody told us this is the only way to live in the world. We're close to that moment. It feels like we're getting there. You know, it's 2012 and you can attach whatever meaning you want to that, but it certainly has that feel that we're approaching that kind of tipping point. Um, I, for one, think we're going to get it right. I'm an eternal optimist, but um, but certainly, you know, if I'm wrong, who's gonna, really going to check anyway? Actually, uh. <laughs> but but I but I, I think we're there. The seeds are really there, and Occupy came along just at that perfect moment in history to t tell us that part. Let's what Gandhi said. Yeah, exactly. become, become the change you want to see. Yeah, become the change you want to see in the world. It's very powerful. I mean, every great sage has told us that. Um, I was just sort of using here and it's interesting because I feel like the, what we're talking about the sort of pent up really pent up desire for something better something different but people haven't been able to, to articulate it haven't been able to manifest it and then this comes along and a lot of people who um, haven't had any experience having their own agency really because all we are is consumers you know in this system and so and if you don't have any practice with that That's like right. we're all babies and learning how to do this. And I think that a lot of people, because they have so much pent up passion and energy and frustration, like, you know, I think where we are right now is trying to figure out, you know, how do we keep that from coming out in ways where we're just butting heads with each other, you know? 
because I think that that can lead to defensiveness, that can lead to, you know, people's egos being on the line, and then they forget why they're here, and then they get discouraged. They say, well, that person was really mean to be there, so I'm never going to come back. And, you know, I feel like um, it, it's this really, it, but, you know, it's not just people being childish. It's actually coming out of a really deep desire and a really long, stifled desire to create a different kind of world. And I think when we can see that in each other, when we can recognize that in each other, we can have a little more patience with each other as we work together to, to make this. Because um, it's not easy. And we may be just sowing the seeds that aren't going to blossom for 20, 30, 100 years. And even if that's all we're doing, we should still be doing it. That's a great reminder. I mean, things didn't get to be this way overnight, yeah. and they're not going to be fixed in the, you know, as much as our desire might be for that. And you combine that with people's sense of righteous frustration about the way the world has been going, it's hard to resist the temptation if you're like, a movement has broken out and it's going to fix all our problems. So it, you know, it doesn't quite go down like that. We have to be in this for the long haul. And quite frankly, even if the movement was to succeed and we found ourselves liberated from the shackles of corporate power, we would still have to be on the job of being perpetual revolutionaries forever and ever and ever and ever, right? It's never some final realized you know, vision where we can all sit around and kick back and say the work is done. We always have to reinvent ourselves and renegotiate our relationships. So this is part of our task is patience 